This is JSA TV and JSA Podcasts, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals. I'm Carl Sketchley, and on behalf of the team here at JSA, welcome to our October virtual roundtable. As we continue to battle through the global pandemic, the security of our financial networks is becoming more critical than ever. As a result, for the next 45 minutes, we have assembled some of the brightest minds in the industry who are going to take us through the current state of network security for global banking and investments, as well as the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. For those of you who are in the group of first 100 registrants for today, please enjoy your lunch, or if you chose, a gift card to a local restaurant. As always though, thank you to all of our viewers for continuing to tune into our roundtables. Just before we begin, as usual, we want to hear from you. So go ahead and type your questions into the chat. Time permitting, we will answer them here. But of course, in the last 15 minutes of the hour, we will take the conversation over to LinkedIn. Just search for hashtag JSA virtual roundtables or simply click on the direct link that we will be sharing in the chat box shortly. Once there, we will cover any of the questions that our panelists don't get a chance to answer within the next 45 minutes. If you would like to register for upcoming virtual roundtables, simply visit jsa.net. Our next one is titled, Best Practices for Partnerships in Next-Gen Network Infrastructure, and that will take place on November 12th at 1 p.m. Eastern. Check it out and register. Now, let's get started. Today's topic, the state of financial networks. To introduce our speakers and moderate, Please welcome Charles Desaget, Managing Partner at Cambridge MC. Charles, thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Carl. Um, I'm very happy to moderate uh, this very impressive uh, panel on this such exciting subject today. So part of the panel, we have Gil uh, Santalis, CEO of New Jersey Fiber Exchange. Mike Persico, uh, CEO of ANOVA Financial Network, and Sujit Panda, CTIO of BDX Data Centers. So before they introduce themselves, I just want to remind the, the subject. So yes, we are talking about the state of financial network. And this is more critical than ever in this specific period of pandemia that we are all experiencing worldwide. That's the first time this is happening. And of course, the transactions are growing exponentially while they are done remotely, and hackers are, of course, more tempted. So um, I would like um, you, uh, each of you, Gil, Sujit, and Mike, to introduce yourself, but I will also ask the first question now, if you don't mind, uh, because today uh, uh, you see we are, we see in this current state, uh, network security is very important, especially for global banking and investments. And we, I would like to have your point of view at what are the challenges or opportunities we lie ahead on this point of view. So maybe, uh, Gil, if you don't mind, if you could start, introduce yourself and maybe answering that question. Sure. So it's Gil Stansley. First of all, Charles, thank you for having me. And JSA, appreciate you putting on this roundtable for us to have a chance to collaborate because we do miss collaborating and having this opportunity is important to kind of exchange ideas. Um, MJFX is the only cable landing station in the US that is carrier neutral with multiple subsea cables and now 26 plus network providers that exchange traffic in North America from, from traffic going from South America and from Europe. We have four subsea cables. Um, to, to answer your question, it's been a wake-up call for the financial industry uh, seven months ago when their associates went home. And there have been some winners and losers in terms of how they transitioned uh, from this new work-at-home environment. Uh, specifically on the security side, um, it's been a challenge because a lot of them have large data centers. Um, they do have some ad adaptation to the cloud, but Primarily, I would say, for the large multinational financial institutions, they have their own facilities, and now the employees aren't in the buildings that used to connect to those facilities. So they've had to 
reorchestrate their network, and that's provided a whole list of uh, security issues for them in terms of how do they authenticate folks coming into their network. Um, as we know, banks have multiple lines of business. It's not just trading. It's all kinds of financial transactions, and it's really the trust business they're in. So security is paramount. Their customers have to trust them, and the transactions that they do are important because they're trusted transactions. So I, I think I'm curious to hear from the rest of our panelists as well in terms of how they see this unfolding, but the number one priority banks have is to be trusted in a secure transaction environment. Thank you very much, Gil. Um, Mike, would you like to introduce yourself or also continue on that question? Sure. Mike Persico, founder and CEO of Anova Financial Networks. And for those of you that don't know, we're an international carrier, explicitly uh, for the electronic trading community. So our MO is to connect the world's liquidity centers. And if they're already connected, then to optimize those connections. We do that through fiber medium and also wirelessly. And so, you know, we have a big footprint in, in not only the US, but also expanding over into Asia. And so, a lot of our customers are, are data center centric, you know, but I certainly can touch on um, what it means to work and trade from home. And, you know, it's, it, it, I'll share an interesting story, but I first want to talk about really what we saw right after the pandemic hit, which was people rushed to increase their internet connectivity because they were going to um, VPN people in from home and the backbone circuits just weren't enough to take uh, in all of these. If you think about how many people work at a uh, Morgan Stanley or JPM or someone like that, that's a lot of people coming into the home office to hit their trading screens that are then connected to uh, the exchange data centers. And, and so it, it was a capacity issue before it was a security issue. And then the security became sort of, a, a, I think, some of the more industry accepted VPN, which, to be honest with you, is fallible. You know, the types of home security that have been prevalent never took into account, you know, the increased requirements of trading. They certainly had that in their home office or in their, their main office, but people didn't have it in their home office. And so what we found after that, when it became apparent that not only was it kind of somewhat insecure, but it might not even meet regulatory standards, we saw a move to people install point-to-point -point circuits to their homes. So to get off the public internet and go on to private dedicated circuits, and, you know, what we, the, the, the humorous part of this was Long Island is where a lot of the New York uh, traders went. Um, they had homes up there. For those of you that don't know, it's two and a half hours east on a good day um, by car. And so um, they, we saw an uptick in point-to-point -point circuits from Manhattan, from their desks where they used to sit, to now their Long Island home. So one gig dedicated <laughs> fiber circuit so they didn't have to uh, be on the internet. And so that's kind of a, a, a sign of the times. And it remains to be seen how many of those traders go back into the office and, and, and how, for how many people this is what it's gonna look like in perpetuity. Thank you very much, Mike. that's very interesting. <laughs> Um, Sujit, you are, you are in India, I believe, in Mumbai. Can you yeah, hear yeah. Mumbai currently, um, sure. yeah. Thank you for having me here. Uh, thanks to you yeah. and the JSA team for putting up this round table. Um, I'm Sujit Panda. I'm the CTIO of BDX. Uh, BDX is a pan-Asian data center platform, um, which we've kind of recently it's not a startup from if you look at the EBITDA that we have currently, but yes, the entire team is a brand new team. We've come together to create a new kind of data center platform, right? And kind of challenging the incumbents in, in most of the markets that we operate in. It's an interesting region to be operating in. We operate in China. We operate, uh, we've got massive facilities in China. We've got uh, two very large uh, facilities in Hong Kong. We have a facility in Singapore. So 
you know, when, when the pandemic actually stuck, we kind of right in the middle of it, right? So it's a kind of a perfect storm for us. So <clears throat> the good part, uh, I'll talk about the good part and the bad part both. So good part was, uh, you know, um, before, before we started BDX, because BDX is basically uh, grown inorganically, right? So the first thing that we had done when we created the platform is what's the kind of, you know, unique thing that we're trying to do in the data center industry. And what we decided is that we would want to have minimally manned data centers, right? Trying to look at how do we automate some of the functions that a data center does, right? So as part of that, uh, you know, MO, the entire focus was trying to get, uh, you know, have a central kind of a, uh, knock, so as to speak, which kind of is the is the humming center wherein all the platforms are being managed from, right? So that's that's the good part. The bad part is, uh, yeah, the the humming center, so as to say, you centralize a lot of functions. That's also going to be hit by the pandemic, right? So, <clears throat> so how do you actually look at you know some of the things that we tried to do? How do you keep most of the critical facilities running without any downtime, right? Uh, how do you help customers? Because, you know, when you're a very large data centers with some of the largest banks in the world operating out of your facilities, how do you support them when they can't get their people in there, right? And they are seeing a massive surge in uh, requirements, massive surge in compute, massive surge in bandwidths. How do you do that, right? You can't get their people there. And your people uh, are, are not able to travel back into the facility. So how do you do it? And that's where the digital investments have paid off uh, in, in some parts. And, and we did a lot of learnings in terms of what we need to do. And the good thing is, uh, you know, uh, we operate on a Jan to December kind of financial year. We do our, we started the AOP thing here. And this is the first time that my CEO walks in and says, hey, you know, you need to ramp up your digital investments, right? Every year, <laughs> you know, I, I, I used to be asked questions like, you need to justify every dollar that you're spending, right? And, sure you know. okay. <laughs> and here he comes, walks in and says, you know, tell me, how are you actually getting everything digital? So there's no question of an ROI anymore. The pandemic has proved that ROI. That's the, that's the good part. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mike, Sajit, and, and Gil, for your introductions on the, the question answer. I'd like to go to another question related to your customers, and of course, related to the subject. Um, is what do, you, do your customers today, in this context, the financial world, want more than anything else? Or maybe related to that one, what do you wish your customers knew? So, I don't know, maybe I start with Gil again? Sure, so, so I, I wish my customers really understood how our industry works. There's only very few financial customers that take the time to understand how their routes work from their facilities to their destinations. But for example, there's cables that cross the Mediterranean and there's single points of failures, for example, in the Suez Canal, but there is an option that if they took the time to understand, they could work with a company called Sparkle, a new cable called Blue Med, and that allows them to bypass that one pinch point. The day that that problem happens, there'll be very few banks that will transact in a normal fashion. And the ones that didn't pay attention will have some issues. There's lots of issues like this across the US, uh, along the I-95 corridor, people aren't familiar, but most of the traffic that goes from New York down to Ashburn finds itself going over the same exact bridge. And there's only very few financials that have taken the time to look at alternate paths. There's a new cable being developed, for example, that's going to go from our building in New Jersey down to Virginia, Myrtle Beach to Florida. It's going to be along the coast. And there's two banks that are currently going to be on that system. I can't imagine the banks that don't go on that system the day that you have a, have a problem going down I-95. So I, I guess what banks I wish they knew was, I wish they took the time to understand our industry and not just buy from a brochure, buy from a salesperson presenting lots of products and services, but to take the time to know their routes and know how it actually works so they can ensure their reliability will always be there. Super, thanks for very interesting. Uh, Mike, 
On the same question? Yeah. You know, what do my clients want more than anything? Volume and volatility. And, uh -huh. and so, okay. you know, it's, uh, it's been interesting because for the first six months, they had both of those in spades. And there was, you know, this was the, the first half of the year was the best trading year in the past 10 and probably since 08. Mm -hmm. And so now things have cooled down uh, since then, since uh, mid-year. And, you know, we, we're, we're seeing a lot of people kind of uh, waiting with bated breath um, until the election, which we do expect to be some of the heaviest traded volume um, in, in recent years as well. So, um, you know, for by all accounts, you know, it's – that this this has been you know a better year on on those uh, from those aspects from a volume and volatility aspect but you know what i wish they knew is that you know it's it's difficult to be an infrastructure provider you know we compete at the nanosecond level you know that's how uh, decisions are being made and you know so gee you talk about return on investment and it's easy uh, to justify returns in my business if you're getting uh, milliseconds, you know, for this improvement. But how do you justify the last nanosecond? And frankly, what's the value of it? And, yeah. and so, you know, you, Gil, you talk about buying off a brochure or, you know, in our world, it's buying off uh, numbers, you know, and numbers that are, you know, two or three decimal point after the decimal point. Right. And so, you know, that takes you know, CapEx investment that takes constant redesign and deployment of new technologies. And it's not a, a snap of the fingers. There's a ton of R&D that go into this. Now, having said this, uh, I, I don't want to sound like I'm crying into my milk because we love what we do. It's exciting. It's challenging. We're on the bleeding edge, you know. Maybe a pat on the back every once in a while might be nice, you know. <laughs> so, um, but uh, that's that's my answer. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, Sujit, your answer. I'm looking. We are looking all for your answer. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, what I think, uh, you know, when we look at security, uh, but what I want my customers to understand is, you know, typically I've seen customers being very focused on one thing: cybersecurity, right? How do I stop an attack from happening? <clears throat> and, and one of the things that I keep saying is, guys, whatever your focus is, right? If it is going to happen, it will happen, right? So <clears throat> instead of focusing on one piece of the continuum, which is, you know, the perimeter, right? Which is, you know, how to stop an attack. Start looking at what do you do when you are under an attack and what do you do after an attack, right? Start looking at all the three pieces. And when you look at the plan in terms of when you, try to create a cyber plan, uh, a cyber security plan, don't just look at how do I prevent an attack from happening. Because, you know, I've seen attack surfaces changing uh, so, so much, right? Technology has broadened, and, and especially the pandemic, and, and I, I think everybody would agree when we, when we put everybody at home, uh, and I think Gil spoke about it when we, when we put uh, Wi-Fi's, um, you know, running from the home, uh, you know, I, I think Mike spoke about the fact that, you know, people want to get off the internet and, and just start to look at point-to-point uh, -point links. All of this was focused on a couple of things. It's, it's trying to be make things less latency sensitive. It's trying to look at getting off the internet, right? So security was one of the concerns. Latency was the other concern, right? But what do you do when you are under attack, irrespective of whether what you are doing? Because you're, you're, when you look at the work-from-home scenario, the entire thing, the entire perspective has changed. So I call this a cyber resiliency instead of cyber security, right? And and uh, the way we have worked with our customers is that we we looked at uh, we had a product which which was BDX Armor, right? So and I I when I went to talk to my financial customers, typically would and we have got some of the among the top five banks with two of the largest banks in the globe sitting inside of data centers. And when I talk to them, they say, hey, guys, you know what? You don't don't talk about these. We've got the best security professionals, right? And nothing can enter our network. I've, I'm not supposed to be speaking about it, but I've seen some of these best protected networks getting, you know, impacted, right? And one of the things that I 
keep talking to on a peer level is it is going to get impact you you're going to get impacted better start looking at when you are under attack what will you do so cyber resiliency is something that i keep kind of pushing my customers to understand a little bit more instead of just preventing attacks yeah and it's a big subject because this is uh, calling by uh, this is part of the subject in the finance industry especially you're going really fast why because there is something to do there is money to get out of it and if you are not protected against that it's a big uh, it's crazy and the experience i have in this this from europe you know i would say that that the large companies the large organizations maybe are protected um, okay but the small and medium ones no they are not protected and if they get attacked Uh, even the uh, finance was small one. They lose everything. They lose their business, and they can close their business. And that's uh, that's absolutely key. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my next question is: uh, I think I will combine two questions. Actually, it is: What is the most exciting development change you see right now for the past, let's say, six months or this year? And also, what is the most adventurous thing? You or your company have done during this time. So maybe, uh, ah, so just while we are while we are together, maybe you want to start with this one. Yeah, kind of. Um, it was a complete paradigm change for us. Um, in terms of, you know, the most adventurous thing, if you want, well, that's a, that's a very exciting question. Uh, you know, we kind of uh, we kind of gave uh, gave out a notification to all of our employees saying that, um, you know, work from home is permanent now. You decide where you want to work from, right? And and um, this is this is not just because um, you know we felt it is in fashion, but the first thing that we realized is that because we have a centralized knock, uh, a centralized way of putting all our management infrastructure at one single place, and when the pandemic hit, the the engineers have to operate out of home, right? Uh, so what do you do, right? So Uh, you know, we took a decision that we will ensure that we set up a practice which is knock with all the engineers operating from the residence, right? So mm-hmm. we shipped up, uh, you know, pre-built kits, right? Saying that this is the kit that goes out. This is how you connect to us. This is how you ensure security. And and by doing that, we ensure that we provided an office-like environment at the residence. So you know, once. And we're still under lockdown, by the way, right? I, I'm in India. The the uh, the uh, DC, the the uh, DR is is going to be in Singapore. The the primary site is in India, and that to Mumbai. And Mumbai is under lockdowns. People are operating from homes. So the thing was, when we took that decision, you know, a lot of people questioned us. We tried to say that your you, your an essential service is being operated out of people's residences. What about the security? We said we talked through this. Right, and touch wood, mm-hmm. this has gone very well. And not just with respect to um, uh, you know the technology piece, but with respect to the psychological aspect of it. You know, one of the big things that I have learned personally when we look at work from home is that it's not just about the technology; it's also about the psychological impact from for work from home people. Right. right? So mm-hmm. we look care of both of this in in a, in a bunch of innovative ways, and that's an adventurous thing that we've done. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Mike, do you want to answer those questions? Do you, shall I? Do you, have you got them? Are you sure. Repeat? So um, yeah. the first part was what was the most interesting thing in the last six months, and the second part was. I know the first part was the most exciting, even exciting, more exciting, interesting. The most yes. exciting, you see, yeah. and then the second one was what was the most adventurous thing you or your company have done during this time. So what you see, what you've done. Exciting, both. Yeah, you know, it was for us, or for me personally, we always felt, you know, this is our, uh, my myself and the management team. This is our third company that we've uh, uh, been a part of that we've built from the ground up. And our mentality was a little old school. We believed that everybody need to be needed to be in a central location. That was how you established morale. And generated a culture and had a confluence of expertise, mm. you know. Mm. And this was very traditional. We weren't we weren't alone in espousing mm. this perspective. And and our big concern, 
um, was what happens when you take that away? Um, you know, do people still feel um, like they're part of something? You know, uh, will the morale main high, uh, remain high? What is your culture then and, uh, as an organization if you're all disassociated? And then, of course, what happens to productivity? Can people still be as pro uh, productive if they're working from home in their PJs? You know, and what we found was is that we were pleasantly surprised. You know, we had serious reservations about doing this. There was challenges. How do you get accounting set up to work remotely when they're inherently kind of a, a very cloistered organization? So you have to put, you know, very sensitive uh, uh, files up, you know, uh, in, a, in an external fashion so people have access to them. But besides that, you know, it was more about culture, morale, and productivity. And what we found is that people uh, responded very well. And, you know, there are some folks that we don't think will, will come back and we're more amenable to letting them do that, you know, as, as a going concern than we ever were. Now, you have the flip side of someone who's younger, they, have, they live in an apartment, they, they have roommates, and so they work in their bedroom, they sleep in their bedroom, they, they go eat their meals in their bedroom, and they live in a, in a hundred square feet. So, you know, they were dying for me to reopen the office. And so yeah. we ended up being 50-50, you know, in terms of people who've come back and, and who, who haven't. But, you know, my takeaway with all of this is that ultimately our productivity stayed high. You find different ways to connect to keep your morale and culture up. And the question is, is can you, how long can that continue? I recall Anderson Consulting went to an all remote model and it lasted for it was great until about year two. And then people became very disaffected and disillusioned and went back to a more traditional uh, environment. That's what they were looking for. And so is, is this, you know, a different scenario, a different situation? Perhaps, but long term, I question if, if it can remain this way. Yeah, and, the, and, the, and that's a good question because, because um, this is happening, as we said, this is happening everywhere for every company, every sector, globally, worldwide. The issue is what's going to be the next step? Because, okay, it works. As you say, productivity works. We can work remotely. We can work from home. We can work from everywhere. At the same time, this is not replacing the real interactivity between people. Look what we are doing right now. Okay, we are doing this exercise. It's great. It works. But of course, we would prefer to be in the same room. We would prefer to do that. So it's, it's a little different. So it's a question of, so again, isolation. And we speak about that also, I think, in many countries. But anyway, um, Gil, I would like to have your point of view on this, on this question. We at NJFX started an initiative before COVID started about getting young people involved in our industry. We started at PTC with Millennials and Telcom, and Felix Sade on our team did a great job in having that first session. Once COVID started, there was a concern that we would stop. And I'm proud to say that our team never stopped. You know, we've got Felix Seda, Sarah Kurtz. They've been actively involved with groups such as Suboptic, working with JSA and doing programs for high schools locally. A lot of folks have looked for leadership during this time. And what my team was able to do is continue on an effort to inspire young people to look at our industry because now it's imperative that we have the next generation ready to go. So we've got a whole pipeline of young folks that we're trying to attract to come into the industry. We went as far as even hiring an intern this summer that we never met. The intern worked for us from Washington, D.C., never came to the office. Um, she did a phenomenal job for us. In terms of exciting things, the, the most exciting thing that I've seen that we're a part of is we've gotten the cable companies, the residential IP providers, to start coordinating at NJFX and offer their access networks to multinational banks, to universities, to hospitals. The whole issue of the internet is that I don't know where it goes. I don't, it's a best effort network. But if you can eliminate hops by having the residential IP providers interconnect with your customers, you all of a sudden have private networks. So I'm happy to say Verizon announced that they're being a customer and a pop at NGFX, a yeah, huge that. provider in the U.S. in terms of residential IP, not only on home services, but on cell phone services as well. 
Altice is here, Comcast is on its way. So we have a massive amount of residential IP and we've got IX providers, such as DKICs, that are coordinating the ISPs so that the enterprise and financials can have better connectivity to their associates that are now at home. Thank you. Congratulations for Verizon. <laughs> yes, yes, no, that's great. Okay, so um, my next question actually is uh, what challenges on opportunities lie ahead, particularly, of course, during these uncertain times, on which challenges are you most excited uh, to face? And actually, Gil, if you could go start with that. You know, I think everyone realizes diversity, network diversity is paramount. And we now have, in the financial markets, everyone paying attention. We spend a lot of time with the banks explaining who the carriers are. The biggest challenge is that they don't have MSAs. So we'll have a large multinational bank move in. They only know how to work with four providers. We've got to find smaller companies that are nimble enough, that have MSAs in place, and can take these unique solutions put them on their paperwork and allow these banks to take advantage of the best network architecture possible. I think that's going to be important going forward. That's what these banks need to see. We need to provide better solutions, better transparency in how these networks really operate, but with the find a way for these large multinational banks to be able to execute their agreements. And, and we're working with companies such as Inova, for example, to kind of see if that makes sense. If they have those relationships, they have those MSAs, could they perhaps work with our strategic network providers, pull together a solution and, and satisfy the bank's requirements? We're going to do a lot more of that, and um, I think that's the next chapter. They need to know how things work. It can't be, you know, get online, I can't give you an answer today. They need clarity on their networks. Okay, thank you very much, Jill. Mike, if you could answer that question as well, what's your point of view? Uh, Mike, you're mute. Can see. Funny story about bank MSAs. <laughs> you know, when we first started doing this uh, 11 years ago, we were we were in front of a, uh, you know, Avenue of America's uh, bank, and 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 I said, how long to do an MSA? And he said, well, you know, how long to give birth? And I said, oh, you know, labor lasts 24, <laughs> 36 hours if if it's a bad one, right? You know. And they meant nine months, right? And, and so, and it, and it took 14, right? So, you know, that's a very real thing. And, you know, sometimes we, what we see is you may have to partner if you want to provide services to a large multinational corporation and you don't have an MSA, the quickest way to revenue, the quickest way to provide that solution is to partner with someone who does. You know, because the doors aren't open to do new ones. Nobody wants to spend those cycles. And by nobody, I mean them. And so, you know, it's uh, that, 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 that's a real challenge. And so I know what you're saying, Gil, in terms of trying to present these diversity options when, you know, the number of people you can go to are somewhat limited. But, you know, in, in regards to challenges, you know, what we see is, you know, we have three legs of the stool or, you know, three arms of the triangle and it's latency, availability, and capacity. And now, you know, there's been a fourth one introduced, which is security. And so the, the challenge here is how do you satisfy four masters? And, you know, to us, it's, you, it's difficult to focus on all of them at once. You almost have to force rank them. But the second that you do that and you decide that one is more important than the others, then you have a contingent of uh, clients that are disaffected with that choice. If you say latency is the most important, other people may say capacity, I, I need capacity. Or if you focus on availability, other people may say, but yes, you know, the, the whole topic of this panel is security. We need that because my traders are never coming back to work. So what are you doing to focus on that as a company? And so three masters was difficult, four is, is a challenge, right? 
And, you know, it's about being smart with your, your investment and your R&D dollars and spreading it uh, 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 across all of those aspects to make sure that you're progressing your products across all of those lines. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. And I will come back to you uh, on the partnership side on the next question. <laughs> but I want to have the, the point of view of Sujit. Yeah, I think, um, uh, you know, Mike... Uh, about a very important thing, you know, the number of legs on a stool is increasing, right? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, the, way, the way I look at this is that, uh, you know, when, when we look at any problem, right, what is that we want to focus on? So, uh, and, and that's the significant change that we look at. We look at any situation that is going to happen and we look at, do we react to the situation or do we react to the people? So we look at, we react to our customers. So. Uh, when we look at that aspect, you know, what's not going to change? I, I, you know, the pandemic happened. Every, everybody asked me, what's changed? I would say, what's not changing? So, uh, Mike, mm -hmm. gave a good good point out, right? Is the diversity in network going to change? Is the customer's requirement for diversity in the network? Like, you know, the customer saying that I want all, I want you to give me all the four things that, that this tool is made of, or five things or six things as we go forward. So what is that we focus on? We focus on the things that are not going to change. Network resiliency, right? Security, right? And infrastructure resiliency. When I look at a data center, what do you want? Infrastructure resiliency in terms of the facility and power. Uh, you need good security, whether it is it is the physical security, whether the perimeter security, the way the car comes inside the building, you need good security. And the third piece is connectivity. So from a connectivity standpoint, I think uh, what the first thing that we looked at is, you know, our customers can now connect to networks through uh, software, right? Uh, we we front end the MSA. It's a trust based relationship that we've set up. For example, in Hong Kong, we've got the carriers inside and say, hey, guys, we're going to be standing, you know, any contract that you're entering is with us. Don't worry about it. We will stand in, in capacity. If it increases, decreases, don't worry about it. I've got a customer. And if he needs more capacity, you don't worry about the billing challenges. We will take care of it. We will stand guard for that. So uh, security, you know, we, we looked at how do we provide right from the physical security to the IT security to actually sitting with our customers and trying to consult with them in terms of what we can do for them, right? So, so that's been the challenging piece, the trying to get our customers to understand our viewpoint in terms of what we think is right, right? And they might not agree, right? So trying mm -hmm. to get into a consultative mode with them and trying to help them understand our point of view has been the most challenging thing. The good part about is where there is a challenge, there is an opportunity. We've been security uh, you know if i look at uh, numbers right we've seen the sales numbers increasing going through the roof from the security side right people have asked for you know um, connectivity solutions people have asked for yeah. you know using shared vpn services people have asked for endpoint security because they want to be kind of connecting to their assets all all over the internet um, we have an sd wan gateway people it's it's kind of you have, we have increased our SD band gateway uh, sizing three three x times from from March till uh, the last upgrade happened last month. Three x times the SD band gateway size. So we've seen everything increasing because there was a mm -hmm. challenge. We responded well, so we making. Uh, I I shouldn't use the word because it looks a little. Uh, you know, uh, the, these are not the best of times. We made money out of it, but yes, because we responded to okay. the challenge. Okay, super, super, excited. I'm just conscious of time. I'm just telling you we, we have six minutes left. We have three more questions that could be okay. So, uh, Mike, <laughs> would you want to 